Hello, my name is Michele Paolato, and this is the extended version of my presentation for the EGU General Assembly 2021. I will be talking about some recent advances in volcano tomography that we've been pushing to try to put the MASH model onto firmer footing. There are two main competing models for how magma is differentiated in arc crust. The classical magma chamber model predicts that um, magma is stored in large volume, long lived, high melt fraction magma chambers, and that differentiation happens by assimilation and fractional crystallization, uh, followed by crystal settling. A typical example is the paper by De Paolo in 1981 that I'm showing on the left. More recently, the crystal mush model has uh, gained in popularity and it predicts that melt is stored in low melt fraction crystal mush for most of its life and that differentiation happens uh, mostly by reacting flow, reactive flow uh, through the crystal mush. Melt rich and volatile rich lenses likely exist at the top of the mush and these feed uh, eruptions. So my approach to this is from the point of view of seismology and i'm interested in the seismological signature of these two models the magma chain for the magma chamber model we expect low velocity anomalies that are very strong of minus 30 to minus 60 percent s-wave shadow zones um, little or no anisotropy strong reflections and diffractions for the crystal mush model, we expect weaker anomalies of minus 10 to minus 30%, some anisotropy and a high BPVS ratio. And volcano tomography is one of the key pieces of evidence for the mush model. Uh, a seminal paper by Jonathan Lees in 2007 reported that most anomalies are found to be in the range of plus or minus 10%, having reviewed um, volcano tomography results for the previous uh, 20 or 30 years. And he concluded that there is a general lack of strong evidence for large regions of pure melt. Cashman and Giordano, in their review of the MASH model in 2014, said that geophysical studies of active volcanic systems have failed to locate large volumes of crystal pure melt. And they took this to um, represent evidence for uh, the crystal MASH model. More recent volcano tomography constraints all seem to support uh, low melt fraction crystal mush beneath active volcanoes. And so, for example, I've worked on Montserrat in the Lesser Antilles, and um, there the VP anomaly is minus 17%. And this corresponds to a melt fraction of 3 to 13%. At Santorini, uh, this is also some work I've been involved in. Um, the velocity anomaly is minus 21%. Uh, corresponding to a 4 to 13 percent melt fraction. The great recent results from Mount St. Helens from the IMASH experiment uh, showed that the VP anomaly is minus 6 to minus 10 percent, corresponding to a 10 to 12 percent melt fraction. And uh, finally, the stunning results from Atipano Puna, Volcano Turunku, uh, show um, VS anomaly of minus 36 percent corresponding to a melt fraction of 10 to 40 percent. However, all of these results have some uh, important limitations that need to be evaluated carefully. The first limitation are the limits to resolution. The resolution length of conventional seismic tomography is typically two to six kilometers for crustal targets, so for depth of five to 20 kilometers. Smaller anomalies can be significantly blurred and uh, be under recovered by tomography. So the typical resolution length uh, for ray tomography is given by the Fresnel radius, which is approximately equal to the square root of the propagation length times the uh, wavelength. And uh, as I said, the typical value is two to six kilometers, and this corresponds to volumes of uh, four to 100 cubic kilometers. So these are quite sizable anomalies that could be blurred or under recovered. And this happens because of wavefront healing. Um, this is a phenomenon uh, consisting of wavefronts wrapping around 
low velocity anomalies and healing uh, behind them due to diffraction of seismic waves. And it means that um, the travel times are not sensitive to the low velocity anomaly, resulting in a limited recovery of the anomalies, a high VP bias, and a likely underestimate of net fraction. So how can we do better? Well, one approach is to use waveform inversion methods, and these have a much smaller theoretical resolution length uh, corresponding to half uh, uh, the wavelength to one wavelength. Typically, that means a few hundred meters to a couple of kilometers, corresponding to volumes uh, smaller than one cubic kilometers to a few kilometers. And I'll talk about this later in my talk. But let's look at the second limitation as well. And these are the uncertainties in the seismic properties of Martian magma. So the uncertainties in the rock physical models that link uh, melt fraction to seismic velocities. These strongly depends, depend on the melt geometry. Uh, typically, we use semi-analytical methods that assume simple melt inclusion shapes like ellipsoidal inclusions with a given aspect ratio. And I'm showing here predictions for, for one of these methods uh, for different aspect ratios. And you can see that um, there's a, a range of different curves. Um, and if we were to use this to predict mat fraction, we would get a range of different results. So if we measured a VP of uh, 4.7 in this case, uh, we could get a mat fraction of 23% with one um, assumption of aspect ratio or as low as 9 and as high as 32%. Uh, an example of this uh, from a um, recent paper by Arnoux et al. for uh, Amid Ocean Ridge shows that different um, assumptions for the aspect ratio lead to widely different melt fraction estimates of between 2 and 8%. So the objectives uh, that I'm pursuing are to use waveform inversion uh, to improve resolution of low velocity anomalies and also to reduce the uncertainty in melt estimates so that we can reassess the seismological evidence for the MASH model. Now, I'm going to use data from uh, Santorini Volcanic System. This was collected as part of the Proteus Active Source Experiment funded by the NSF and led by Emily Hooft from the University of Oregon. Uh, we deployed 91 ocean bottom seismometers around the island of Santorini, which is in the middle here. The, the yellow dots are all the stations and the red lines are the shooting lines um, carried out with the Marcus Langseth research ship. So Emily, uh, together with Dark Toomey, supervised uh, some students, Ben Heath and Bernard McVeigh, McVeigh that did an excellent job doing the travel time uh, inversion. And the results uh, of their work are published and you can go and have a look at them. But I'm going to talk today about uh, more recent results from full wave from inversion of the Columbo submarine volcano, which is situated just to the northeast of Santorini. It's part of the same magmatic system. It last erupted in the 1650 uh, with um, VEI of 4, so an explosive eruption that sent pyroclastic flows to the shore of Santorini, killing several people causing a tsunami and sending ash as far as Turkey. In the last few decades, there's been seismic unrest at Columbo, and it poses a significant tsunami hazard. So we used full wave from inversion on a subset of the Proteus dataset. The work was carried out mostly by uh, Kainta Krapchevitz, who is a student at Imperial College, using the full wave from inversion code uh, developed uh, internally. So the advantages of full wave from inversion are that it uses more of the data. It matches the data wiggle for wiggle instead of just using the travel times. And it offers better resolution down to uh, 100 meters uh, in some cases, and it is less affected by wave from healing and by the high VP bias that I described. This was our starting point. This is the output of the travel time tomography and is the starting model for the full wave from inversion. I'm showing a cross section across Columbo volcano, which is there. Columbo on the seabed uh, looks like a little 500 meter wide crater. 
there's a weak low VP anomaly that we can see from travel time tomography, but nothing uh, to make us suspect the presence of melt. After full wave from inversion at 3 Hz, uh, the VP anomaly has grown considerably and it's now quite significant. And as we progress, including higher frequency in the inversion, until we invert frequencies up to 4.5 Hz, and now that VP anomaly, uh, that low VP anomaly has come into sharp focus, and it's really quite a significant feature. We're currently working on including higher frequencies, and this will sharpen the image even further. But let's have a look at the properties of this low VP anomaly. The absolute VP at the center of the anomaly is 3,600 meters per second, and this is a really low velocity. The strength of the anomaly is minus 1900 to minus 2400 meters per second, depending on what we choose as a reference background. So the VP for granite is uh, between 5500 and 6000 meters per second. And this gives us a, a percentage anomaly of minus 35 to minus 40 percent. This is a very significant uh, VP anomaly. So how do we estimate melt fraction? Well, one option is to use experimental relationships. So if we were able to measure the P of partially molten rocks in the lab, we could then um, fit the experimental data to derive uh, a curve that we can use, uh, that we can invert to determine MET fraction from the P or BS. Um, there are also analytical methods. Uh, like I described before, that assume simple mate inclusion shapes. Uh, but this depends strongly on aspect ratio. An alternative approach uses the critical porosity uh, concepts, but it also depends on some poorly constrained parameters like the critical porosity and the properties of uh, the background matrix and the melt. So an alternative approach uh, that I'm following consists of carrying out numerical homogenization using the um, magma or mush microstructure from X-ray CT scanning. So very quickly, uh, this is how it works. We recover uh, a mush fragment from the eruptive product. Uh, this could be, for example, in the form of a glomerular crest of a, or a mafic inclusion. We then carry um, X-ray CT scanning of the sample. We segment that 3D image into the components, so the different crystals, glass, and bubbles. We reconstruct the paleoporosity or the paleomet fraction and build a virtual rock sample that we then populate with the elastic properties and model the elastic response with numerical, me numerical methods. And this allows us to derive the effective elastic properties of the sample. There are different approaches for solving the numerical homogenization problem. Uh, dynamic methods uh, solve a wave propagation problem, but through the digital sample, um, this is equivalent to a post-propagation experiment in the lab. Essentially, we simulate the propagation of seismic waves through the sample. We extract P and S wave travel times, and we repeat this in multiple directions to determine the average anisotropic VP and VS. Static methods, on the other hand, simulate a static load experiment. Um, and if we consider multiple load cases, like compression and shear loads, we can calculate the stress and strain distribution for these different cases and determine the full elasticity matrix. Uh, let's have a look at a date, real data application. We've looked at um, a mosh fragments from St. Kitts in the Lesser Antilles. Um, this is a volcano that erupts undersized but the mush fragment is a coarse-grained gabbro cumulate, and it's described by Melikova et al. 2017. It has a 14% med fraction. Um, simple binary segmentation was carried out into the solid and melt components, and then we populated this with the elastic properties of those components, so solid crystal um, and a liquid basaltic melt. Uh, this gives us a 3D digital rock model um, to which we apply FFT homogenization. This is a particular static method for determining the effective elastic properties. I won't go into the details of the method, but it's a computationally efficient method because of the use of the FFT. It's grid-based, so it doesn't require complicated meshing. 
and we're using an open source library developed by Felix Ospold. So with this, from the segmented sample, we can determine the uh, full elasticity matrix that I'm showing here. And then from this, we can determine the P and the S with the full anisotropy description. We can then compare these results with some of the semi-analytical methods that I described. So I'm showing here predicted curves for VP and VS versus MEL fraction uh, for uh, calculated with a self-consistent approximation uh, for ellipsoidal MET inclusions with different aspect ratios between 0 0.07 and 0 0.14. So these are oblate spheroidal inclusions. And those are the predicted values, values for the sample from the same kids. So our digital rock physics predictions are consistent with an equivalent aspect ratio of 0 0.07 to 0 0.14. So on average, 0 0.1. And it also gives us a um, prediction of the critical porosity, which is between 45 and 55 percent. This is where we see this kink in the properties. This is um, the aspect ratio, the equivalent aspect ratio that we predict is consistent with the results by uh, Take 2000, which are based on um, analyzing the equilibrium geometry and the dihedral angles. With this information, we can go back to studying the MET fraction at Columbo Volcano. So we can take um, range of aspect ratio between 0 0.07 and 0 0.14, apply um, this to the conditions at Columbo, and predict a range of constitutive relationships uh, that link to link VP to MET fraction. So I'm showing he here the envelope of constitutive relationships for these this range of aspect ratio, also considering two different uh, methods, the self-consistent method and the differential effective medium method. The VP of the anomaly is 3.6 kilometers per second. And if we trace uh, a horizontal line here, we can determine the expected interval of MET fraction, which is between 28 and 44 percent. This is possibly the highest reported MELT fraction estimate from VP. But there may be some higher estimates using VS, which is more sensitive to uh, melting. And it's a very significant uh, melt fraction that is close to the critical porosity. And it could be even higher, uh, pending um, full wave from inversion with higher frequency. The volume of this anomaly is smaller than one cubic kilometer, so it's really quite small. Um, compared to the, the size of the volcanic and magmatic system. The low VP anomaly continues deeper, uh, but it's weaker at greater depth. So this may correspond to a relatively small, but high med fraction body that sits at the top of the magmatic system. Um, similar to predictions of the MUSH model. So our conclusions are that we can use full wave from inversion uh, to image low velocities uh, and to improve the resolution. We've used this uh, to image a uh, rather small low velocity volume beneath Columbo volcano. It has the largest measured VP anomaly of minus 35 to minus 40 percent, and this is really substantial. We've then looked at the microstructure of crystal mush using a sample from St. Kitts, um, showing that it has an equivalent aspect ratio of 0 0.1. And this allows us to narrow down the range of possible aspect ratios, make a prediction for the melt fraction of Columbo of between 28 and 44%. But it could possibly be above, above 50%. So this is likely a small volume, high melt fraction melt lens at the top of a magmatic system. Of course, we need to do some more work. Um, a lot of the existing legacy seismic data uh, is not suitable for using waveform inversion methods. So we need to 
come up with new ways to collect seismic data that can make use of uh, these newer methods that uh, provide better resolution and are not so sensitive um, and not so affected by wavefront healing. We also need more information from petrology on the microstructure of marsh and magma for a wide range of med fraction and compositions. So if you've got uh, this kind of data, please get in touch with me and I look forward to discussing the results uh, in the public chat. Thanks for your attention.